tin might not be the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about what metals we need in society today. But in fact, tin is very important, not just for our modern way of life, but also for the energy transition. In this video, let's have a look where tin actually comes from. Tin is a silvery metal so soft you can bend it with your bare hands. Most tin is used as a corrosion resistant coating for steel or as an alloy with other metals such as lead or zinc to improve their corrosion resistance. For example, early bronze was an alloy of tin and copper. But perhaps the most important application for tin for the modern human is its use as a soldier. Tin, often alloyed with lead, is an excellent solder due to the relatively low melting point compared to most other metals. Therefore, it is crucial in connecting copper electrical wiring, for example in computer and smartphone circuit boards, in photovoltaic cells, batteries and all other electronic equipment. As such, it is one of the key metals needed for the energy transition and in the modern society. Without the tin soldering, solar panels, wind farms and all the electronic equipment we use simply wouldn't work. So where in the geological environment does tin occur? Tin is obtained chiefly from the mineral cassiterite, which is a tin oxide mineral. Most tin mines globally are in alluvial deposits where the heavy cassiterite mineral has accumulated due to fluvial activity. But how does the cassiterite get into the alluvial deposit in the first place? Tin is in fact a common but minor constituent of igneous rocks, particularly in granites intruded into the crust along active continental margins. It is generally thought that either fractional crystallization or partial melting processes are the reason for the enrichment of tin in certain types of granite. So let's see how this might work. Let's look at fractionation first. When a magmatic body gradually crystallizes, all the minerals won't precipitate at once, as certain minerals crystallize before others. The elements that make up these minerals quite naturally form solid minerals, such as feldspars or biotite. But other elements are not quite so easily incorporated into the crystal lattice of these common minerals. These are the so-called incompatible elements, such as tin, and they will get enriched in the residual fluids that are left over after the initial crystallization. And this process is called fractional crystallization. If these enriched fluids and melts are then extracted, as can often happen in active tectonic settings, they move elsewhere and crystallize as separate granite bodies at lower temperatures. And in fact, the fractional crystallization process can repeat itself in these extracted molten bodies. And the more times this process is repeated, it helps to enrich the incompatible elements into the residual fluids. But the reverse can also happen. If a solid volume of rock is heated up, it may experience partial melting and the first elements to go into the melt are the incompatible elements. If the original rock contains tin, it will be enriched in these partial melts and fluids, which can then be transported away along faults and fractures. And that is why tin quite often occurs in areas where you have a lot of granitic intrusions, like here in Cornwall, southwest England. 
Here, tin was mined from alluvial deposits for centuries, but the miners eventually discovered that there was a lot of cassiterite in the rocks as well. There are many huge granitic plutons in the southwest of England. The tin ore precipitated from hot magmatic fluids as quartz veins and pegmatite dikes cross-cutting both early granite and its metamorphic host rocks. The source of these fluids isn't quite known with certainty, but they probably originated from granitic melts at depth. In addition to cassiterite, the veins commonly also contain other minerals enriched with incompatible elements, such as tourmaline and fluorite. The tin mineralization here isn't mined now, but Cornwall was once famous for its tin deposits. The mining heritage of Cornwall is part of its touristic attraction today. I'm visiting Giver Mine Museum near Penzance, the largest preserved tin mine in Cornwall. The museum hosts various exhibitions and you can also visit some parts of the underground workings and look at specimens of various ore minerals. Well, the alluvial deposits were exploited by the Romans and the tin was shipped back to Rome where it was used to produce bronze. But hard rock mines developed over time, but by the 16th century they had cropped up all over the southwest of England. Cornwall and Devon provided most of the United Kingdom's tin, copper and arsenic until the 1900s. All in all, Cornwall produced an estimated 2 million tonnes of tin to maturity in the 19th century. But as the 20th century was drawing to a close, the price of tin just wasn't high enough to sustain mining in Cornwall. Giver, like all the other metallic mines in the UK, had to close. But like the many other metals needed in the energy transition, there are significant pressures now to increase both the production of tin and the security of supply. The price of tin has significantly increased in the past 20 years, and mines that were not e economic back then might well be that today. There are no plans to reopen the Giver mine, but there is renewed interest in the tin mineralization elsewhere in the southwest of England. For example, another old mine site nearby, South Crofty, which was a copper tin mine that closed in 1998, has been attracting some serious interest. It has been considered by various companies in the past 20 years until it was obtained by Cornish Metals, who are currently working to reopen the mine. But well, let's now get back to tin enrichment processes and look at how tin alluvial deposits form. Alluvial processes are in fact a really efficient way to enrich cassiterite deposits and other heavy minerals. Cassiterite is a relatively heavy mineral, so when a cassiterite rich rock weathers and gets eroded by surface waters, the cassiterite is washed away from its source and accumulates in the sediments downstream. This accumulation occurs in areas where the energy of the flow suddenly drops, so that the water is unable to carry the heavier minerals further downstream. Inside bends of meandering rivers are an example of such a locality. As the process gets repeated of thousands and thousands of years, significant volumes of sediments enriched in heavy minerals can form. 
About 80% of world's tin comes from alluvial deposits and Indonesia and China are the biggest producers with countries like Bolivia and Peru also being important. But tin supply for many of these countries is problematic. About one third of all the tin mined in the world has come from Banka and Belitung Islands in Indonesia. Tin mining has been going on here for such a long time that cassiterite ore deposits are becoming harder to get to. But unfortunately, the regulations around environmental and personal safety of mining in Indonesia lag far behind those in Europe and in many other parts of the world. As tin ore pits have become deeper, the number of lethal cave-ins has risen. 2011 was a particularly bad year in Indonesia, with one tin miner killed almost every week. So there is a clear need to find new, less problematic sources for tin. Places like Cornwall might not offer the biggest and most significant business globally, but increasing the variety of tin sources will increase both the security of supply and bring welcome income to the local communities. And perhaps most importantly, responsible small-scale mining in a jurisdiction with strong environmental and societal regulations results in minimal environmental footprints. As with all metals we need to fight global warming, tin too has to be mined in a way that minimizes the environmental 